you, Sean, and it's, it's wonderful to be here. So this is a slightly different audience than I'm used to speaking to. So I'm very excited about that and, and hope that uh, we can have a good discussion today. So um, as Sean mentioned, I'm going to talk today about the work we've been doing, particularly in vaccine design and the novel nanomaterials that we're building for this purpose. So disclosure slide, we spun out a company last year uh, developing nanoparticle vaccines related to this technology. So right now, as many of you know, we're right in the middle of a technological revolution in vaccine design. Everything is changing uh, and it's, it's really been driven by technological advances. And on this slide, I'm showing three examples of kind of new vaccine technologies that have emerged from these advances. Um, right at the top, you know, there's a ton of people doing work on structure-based antigen design where you try to figure out what is the best antigen that we can present to program the immune system to respond against a given pathogen in precisely the way that we want it to. And the example I'm showing here is the pre-fusion confirmation of RSVF uh, from respiratory syncytial virus. I'll be talking more about this particular molecule later in the talk. At the bottom left, uh, this is a, an approach pioneered by Bill Sheaf, who used to be here at UW and is now at Scripps, called germline targeting, where you engineer antigens to go in and activate specific naive B cells that are known to be the precursors of broadly neutralizing antibodies, and then you shepherd those B cells towards uh, their broadly neutralizing state. And so it's really this remarkable example of how people can program the immune system based on the knowledge of antibody-antigen interactions, their structures, and then uh, antibody maturation. And then finally on the bottom right, uh, novel vaccine delivery technologies are, are a huge thing right now. Um, and one of the really exciting ones is, is the use of mRNA um, as a mechanism for delivering antigens or immunogens. And here, you know, this is a genetic immunization method where you never make protein or you never make a whole pathogen in a factory. You manufacture a nucleic acid encoding any sequence you want and you inject that nucleic acid and the patient's own cells produce the antigen. So the potential of this technology for rapid response to emerging diseases is really enormous. So this is just kind of some examples of, of the exciting things that are going on uh, in the vaccine field these days. So um, one of the things that, that my group is focusing on and that we're particularly excited about, and it's one piece of these, these new technologies, is uh, self-assembling immunogens. So it's been known for quite a long time. This is a review from over 20 years ago. So it's really been known for a while that uh, repetitive arrays of antigen induce stronger humoral immune responses. And this is really thought to be driven mainly by B cell receptor cross-linking on the B cell surface. So this repetitive array of antigen cross-links the B cell receptor that leads to stronger signaling and expansion of those B cells. And this makes sense, right? Repetition is something that's commonly observed in pathogens. Viruses are symmetric and repetitive. Bacterial cell walls have repetitive elements. And so it makes sense that the immune system has evolved to detect this as a danger signal. More recently, uh, we've gotten a better mechanistic understanding of the roles that particulate or repetitive antigens play. So this is a recent review from GSK um, where they're highlighting uh, that B cell receptor cross-linking that I was mentioning, but then also some of the addition additional signaling that comes along with that. So particulate antigens are good. There's also trafficking effects in interactions with the innate immune system that are driving these enhanced immune responses. So we have clinical experience with protein nanoparticle vaccines. The licensed vaccines for human papillomavirus and hepatitis B um, are self-assembling protein nanoparticles. Uh, these are really remarkably effective subunit vaccines that just contain one recombinant antigen they are not derived from the whole pathogen. And so these vaccines are examples of how this repetition or these nanoparticle vaccines can really be quite effective. So kind of one of the, the more recent technological developments, and in my opinion, a turning point in this field, was this paper uh, from the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH in 2013, where they used non-viral 
self-assembling proteins to scaffold what I will call a complex antigen. In this case, they were working with influenza hemagglutinin. It's a trimeric glycoprotein, disulfide bonds, proteolytic processing, right? So this is a complex protein, and this is something that you wouldn't be able to put, for example, on the hepatitis B particles that we looked at on the last slide. Those particles just could not handle, handle this antigen. So what um, this group at the NIH showed was that this self-assembling protein ferritin, which is an iron storage protein, but really you can think about it as just a structural protein. It assembles into a 24 subunit octahedron, was capable of scaffolding hemagglutinin, this complex antigen. And you get these particles that are very monodispersed. This is one of the advantages of proteins. They fold to native states, single native states, and so every particle looks like every other one in the test tube or in the vaccine. There are other advantages to self-assembling proteins. For instance, you seamlessly integrate the antigen to the uh, multivalent presentation platform through genetic fusion. Um, if you're gonna make a, a protein antigen anyway, you might as well make it at the same time that you make your self-assembling platform. And in this paper, they further showed that you get uh, dramatic increases in the humoral response uh, by a few different measures against influenza virus and in fact outperform significantly the uh, commercial trivalent inactivated vaccine. So this paper was, was again really a turning point. In addition to kind of this repetition of antigen, as I mentioned, there are effects on vaccine trafficking that are beneficial as well. So this is some beautiful work last year from Daryl Irvine at MIT and again Bill Sheaf showing that a nanoparticle vaccine that they call the EOD 60 mer uh, trafficked to lymph nodes and co-localized with the follicular dendritic cell network in B cell follicles much more efficiently than a soluble version, a non-particulate version of that same antigen, which showed up mostly in the medulla of the lymph node. And they correlated this to increased humoral responses and showed that this trafficking is really playing a significant role. So the work to date in this field until recently was really focused on a small set of these naturally occurring self-assembling proteins. So I mentioned ferritin, this octahedral complex. Uh, this is the EOD 60 mer that I mentioned on the last slide. And then there's a, a 60 subunit protein called encapsulin that people have also used more recently. This is just a small sampling of the publications that have emerged from this work. So it's really been a successful approach and it's one that has now moved into the clinic. So again, this is very recent work. That first paper was 2013, but we're all already seeing these things showing up in phase one clinical trials. However, the, the use of these naturally occurring self-assembling self proteins is really fundamentally limited in that, you know, ferritin is ferritin and it's always going to be ferritin. You can't really change its structural properties. You can't really do anything to it. And at, I may be biased, but we're at the Institute for Protein Design, and so we think that maybe if you had the ability to tailor the structural properties of, of your self-assembly platform, you could get even better immune responses. You could really build something for the job. And so this is kind of a, a cartoon that we use to illustrate this. If you were trying to make an alarm clock out of things that you find readily available around your house, you would come up with some ridiculous, non-robust Rube Goldberg contraption, but instead if you build the pieces for the technology that you want, you can end up with an Apple Watch, right? Something that's simple, robust, and controllable. And so that's really our goal is to try to, you know, enable this sort of technological approach to, to vaccine design um, instead of just, just using what's out there. And so to do this, we use a, a software suite called Rosetta. Um, so this is software that, that was born here at UW in the lab of David Baker and is now developed worldwide by a very vibrant community of, of developers. And Rosetta is a, it's a, it's just a macromolecular modeling suite for uh, modeling and engineering proteins. It can do many different things, you know, classic protein structure prediction from amino acid sequence, docking proteins together, you know, designing new proteins de novo, et cetera, et cetera. And so when we set out to come up with a new method for designing novel self-assembling proteins with structures customized for specific applications, we did so by combining two pre-existing elements of the software. 
uh, the ability to design interfaces between two different proteins, protein-protein interface design, and the ability to model symmetric arrangements of protein subunits. And so the method that we came up with <coughs> is graphically depicted here. So if we focus just on the top row, it's these two fundamental steps. Uh, docking, where you figure out how protein blo building blocks fit together in three dimensions, and then design or mutation, where you're coming up with a new amino acid sequence. And so just, just to walk through this briefly, uh, everything we do uh, makes use of mathematical symmetry. We're building these materials the same way that nature does. The vast majority, you know, 99% of self-assembling proteins uh, self-assemble according to mathematical symmetry groups. In this case, we're using icosahedral point group symmetry, uh, which contains five-fold and three-fold rotational axes. So we go and we find protein building blocks that match those elements of symmetry. For instance, this gray pentamer and this orange trimer that have five-fold and three-fold symmetry. And we align those along the corresponding symmetry axes in the target architecture. When we do that, there are only a few degrees of freedom in the system, and we sample those computationally to find how these building blocks best fit together. Once we've done that, we go in and design, or again, make up a, a new amino acid sequence at this novel protein-protein interface that if we get it right, should stabilize that interface and drive assembly specifically to the target architecture. So at the end of the day, what you get out of the computer is a hypothesis in two parts, an amino acid sequence and a three-dimensional structure that you predict that amino acid sequence will form. And so, you know, because this is encoded in software, we can run this over and over again, hundreds of thousands, millions of times, and come up with a vast array of potential new nanomaterials. And so then we go into the lab and we test those hypotheses to see how accurate our predictions were. And this slide has a few examples of new nanoparticles that we designed. So these are 120 subunit complexes. There are a couple megadaltons of molecular weight. They're about the size of an adeno-associated virus. Um, and when we image them by electron microscopy, you can see these fields of monodispersed particles. Again, proteins adopt the native state, and so every particle looks like every other. And when we average those particles and compare them to projections calculated from the computational design models, we find that you know, they closely resemble what we made up in the computer. And when we go and solve high-resolution structures by X-ray crystallography and compare the real-world material to the computational design on an atom-by-atom -atom basis, we find that generally these things are accurate to within about an angstrom or less, so about half the width of an oxygen atom. So we've predictively positioned every atom in these virus-sized assemblies. And so again, what that allows you to do is really tailor the structural features of the material to specific applications. So if you wanted something that's more porous, for example, you would go for this architecture on the left. If you wanted something that's less porous, you would go for the architecture on the right. If you want an 18 nanometer particle, a 19 nanometer, a 20 nanometer, you can design precisely that. And it's not limited to just nanoparticles. That's what I'll be talking about in the context of vaccines. But any mathematical symmetry group is amenable to this approach. And so a couple papers recently out of David's group um, showed the design of one-dimensional helical fibers with helical symmetry, so like microtubules, um, and two-dimensional layers with plane group symmetries that extend for microns in, in two dimensions. And now we're designing three-dimensional crystals, uh, asymmetric materials, pseudosymmetric materials, all kinds of stuff. So it's really fun. I tell people all the time when they ask what I do at work, I play Legos with proteins. So one of the things that, that we've also turned to recently is, is full de novo design of these nanoparticles. So the examples that I, I have shown so far use naturally occurring protein building blocks. But now what we're doing is we're making up the monomeric protein completely de novo and then using those to form oligomers that are tailored for genetic fusion to antigens of interest. So we put, for example, the N-termini here in, as blue spheres in just the right geometry uh, such that we can fuse, for instance, HIV envelope from its C-terminus to the N-terminus of the nanoparticle subunit. And then we use these building blocks to design particles that are really tailored for the display of HIV envelope, influenza hemagglutinin, 
or really any other antigen. So one of the, the key features that I'll talk about in the vaccine work is the fact that these materials are constructed from two different protein subunits. So we call these two component materials. And the reason that's important is that it allows you to express the two subunits independently. They don't know the other one exists until you mix them in a test tube, at which point they spontaneously assemble to the target architecture. So this is a gel filtration chromatogram showing that you get a single symmetric peak indicating a monodispersed population of particles. Over here at around 18 mils is where residual unassembled building blocks elute. And you can see the tiniest of bumps there, but it's really a pretty efficient uh, in vitro assembly process. And I'll talk about how we use that uh, shortly. But one of the things we wanted to do, we're, we're very interested in, in translation if possible. We would love for these things to go out into the world and have an impact. And so we, thinking about translation, you have to think about manufacturability. You know, is this a viable technology that can, can be uh, produced at scale? And so Adam Morgaki, a research scientist in the group, has really been digging into this uh, uh, in vitro assembly process over the last couple of years in really great detail to determine how robust it is, or alternatively, how sensitive it is to the assembly conditions. And one of the key parameters we've been playing with is the stoichiometry of the two subunits, so the A component and the B component. And you can titrate this in these, in these two component nanoparticles and see what effect that has on assembly. So you could do an, an assembly reaction at a quarter to one or one to one or two to one subunit stoichiometry. And then we quantify nanoparticle formation and residual unassembled components. And if you plot that as a function of the ratio of the components, what you see is that up to about one to one, you get this linear increase in nanoparticle formation, after which it plateaus. If you continue adding more of one of the components, you don't get more particles. And that suggests that we're, we're getting complete particles. Otherwise, you would get partial assemblies, and it would look like you're getting more particle formation. And so, you know, the idea of completeness implies cooperativity. And so we've been looking at this in great detail. And ultimately, we wanted to convince ourselves for sure that we're getting complete particles. And so we turned to native mass spectrometry and collaborated with a group of Albert Heck in the Netherlands. And he found that, indeed, you do only see the complete nanomaterial coming out of the end of these in vitro assembly reactions. You see the 120 subunit assembly and nothing else. And so that was very comforting, and we think that, you know, is, is a good sign for trying to translate and, and manufacture these materials. So vaccines. So the way that we use these to make vaccines, again, is by multi, multivalently displaying an antigen or an antigenic fragment from a pathogen. So these vaccines are really geared at inducing humoral responses, antibody responses. We get CD4 responses, but we don't get CD8s because these things don't get into the cell and you don't get presentation on MHC1. That's something, that's kind of one of our long-term goals, but it's, it's a difficult problem. But as I mentioned at the beginning, arraying antigen in this repetitive array drives these humor, humoral responses. And for many pathogens, that's what you want. You want neutralizing antibodies uh, to prevent infection. So what we do is we take the gray and the orange nanoparticle subunits that we've designed to form this soccer ball-like structure and we genetically fuse an antigen of interest to one of them. And uh, one of the nice things about this is this enables the use of standard recombinant biologic production techniques. So you're just making two proteins, just like you would make an antibody, and then you mix those two proteins in vitro, and you get the particles out the other side. So we've done this over the last few years with a number of different antigens. RSVF is here at the top right, influenza hemagglutinin, HIV envelope, uh, and a, a long list of, of other antigens. This has all been collaborative work with, with a huge array of collaborators worldwide, which has been really, really fun uh, working with everyone to push this forward. And so I'll talk a little bit about the, the RSV particles because those are one of our leading candidates. So I mentioned this on the very first slide, this, this pre-fusion confirmation of the F protein. And this is really, it's just a beautiful story, just a beautiful scientific story. Uh, this is again from the Vaccine Research Center. So the challenge, one of the challenges in RSV vaccines is that this F protein antigen, 
is a membrane fusion protein, like hemagglutinin, so its job is to, to fuse the viral membrane with the host cell membrane, facilitating viral entry into the cell. And as such, it undergoes a dramatic conformational change. The problem is that for RSV in particular, the post-fusion state of the protein is by far more stable than the pre-fusion state. So when people were trying to make subunit vaccines for RSV, and they would recombinantly produce this F antigen, it would always spontaneously snap to the post-fusion structure. What the, the group at the NIH realized was that this is actually a pretty poor antigen. There were several phase three vaccine trials that failed to meet their endpoints using this antigen. And what the, what the group at the NIH did was they isolated monoclonal antibodies that are specific for the pre-fusion conformation, used those to solve the structure of the pre-fusion conformation, and then used that structure to engineer mutations that would stabilize the protein in that pre-fusion state. And then when they used that pre-fusion antigen, which they called DSCAV1, as a vaccine, as a subunit vaccine, they saw about a tenfold increase in neutralizing antibodies over the post-fusion antigen that had failed multiple phase three trials. So this was really a step change uh, in the RSV vaccine field and really revitalized the field just a few years ago. And so what we did is we took their pre-fusion antigen, DSCAV1, which I'm showing here in blue, and we genetically fused that to our nanoparticle subunit, as I described, and made nanoparticles um, out of that to see if this would be an even better vaccine. So we do extensive quality control on these to make sure that the particles are nicely formed, they're not aggregating, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you'll notice that when we average uh, particles by electron microscopy, the antigen kind of blurs out. It gets a little bit blurry. And that's because we used a flexible genetic linker to link the antigen to the underlying nanoparticle. So it really is kind of waving around. It's an open question what effect that has on the immunogenicity of the vaccine. It's something we're exploring now through design. But when David Wiesler here in the biochemistry department solved a single particle reconstruction of this nanoparticle by cryo-EM, he couldn't even see the antigen. He just saw the nanoparticle core. Um, but uh, one of the other things that we noticed when we started characterizing this nanoparticle was that uh, fusion to our nanoparticle subunit further stabilized the pre-fusion conformation of the F protein. So I think it's clearest here. These are classic guanidine denaturations of these proteins. So as you go up here, you're losing foldedness. The protein is unfolding. And in the trimeric soluble antigen from the NIH, you get this early unfolding transition that's just completely absent once you fuse that antigen to our nanoparticle subunit. So this is a little bit unexpected, um, but, but something that we were very pleased about uh, when we saw it. And so, of course, the real test is the levels of, of neutralizing antibodies that the vaccine induces. And so here's some data from mice where we're comparing in purple the soluble trimeric antigen to three different nanoparticles that, it, that present that antigen at varying valency. So one of the things we can do with these two component nanoparticles is dope in unmodified trimeric subunits and basically leave empty spots on the particle where there isn't an antigen. And we can control how many empty spots there are. So this is 33, 67, and 100% valency particles. And what we found was that at full valency, the particles induced about tenfold higher levels of neutralizing antibodies in both mice and non-human primates. That effect is, is strictly linked to nanoparticle assembly. So we made a control where uh, the antigen is fused to the nanoparticle trimer, and we include in the vaccine a pentameric component, but the pentamer doesn't have the computationally designed interface, so it cannot drive assembly of the particle. All of the protein is there, all of the T cell epitopes are there, there's just no assembly, and in that case, what you see is no difference at all from the soluble trimeric antigen. So it shows that the enhanced humoral response is really directly linked to particle formation. Because we're using heterologous proteins to build these nanoparticles, you see an immune response against the particle itself, right? These are foreign proteins. They're arrayed symmetrically. 
And so naturally the body mounts an immune response against them. So we measure that and, and quantify it, and it is really a robust response against the particle. The next question is, does that matter? Does that affect the antigen-specific response? And so we did an experiment here in mice where we pre-immunized one group of mice with uh, unmodified nanoparticles. So just the nanoparticle itself, no antigen. And we generated high levels of anti-scaffold antibodies and then came in and boosted those animals with the antigen-bearing particle. And what we found is that there, compared to animals that did not receive the pre-immunization, there was no deleterious effect on the level of antigen-specific antibodies or virus-neutralizing antibodies. So at least in this particular model, that anti-scaffold response doesn't seem to have an effect. This is something that I think we need to keep our eye on, particularly as we move into humans. But so far, seems to be encouraging. So apologies for those of you in the room that work on HIV, but HIV is just the worst uh, in pretty much every respect. Um, and my introduction to HIV was when we put a native-like envelope trimer, so the, the fusion glycoprotein from HIV, onto our particles, and it was actually worse, that's in purple, than the corresponding soluble trimer in terms of uh, neutralizing antibodies that the vaccine elicited. So this is the first time that we actually saw the particle behaving worse than the soluble antigen. We were very confused by that and, and really wanted to figure out what was going on there. And so we did a lot of really detailed in vitro characterization. And what we discovered was that the particular strain of HIV that we were using called BG505 happens to have a couple glycans missing kind of low down on the trimer. So HIV envelope has this really dense glycan shield. It's an extremely heavily glycosylated protein, and that prevents antibodies bind from binding much of the peptidic surface. But when there's a hole in the glycan shield, like on BG505, that's kind of a chink in the armor, and the immune system targets that preferentially. So the major epitope for neutralizing responses against BG505 happened to be way down here on the trimer. And when we put that trimer on our particle, it resulted in a very crowded situation where B cell receptors can't access that epitope. So the chink in the armor is just unreachable, right? And so we said, okay, maybe that's what's going on here. Let's switch to a different strain of HIV envelope that has its vulnerability up at the trimer apex so that it's highly exposed. So when we did that, when we switched to the strain that has its vulnerability up at the top of the antigen, what we found was that indeed we get the same increase in the neutralizing antibody response in red uh, that we saw with RSV. And so that taught us a very important lesson. We learned from this that you can't just slap an antigen on a particle and expect it to do better. While that often works, there are going to be cases where it fails, and that further suggests that you could probably be getting even better responses if you really tailor the detailed geometry of epitope presentation. And so that's something that we've also seen in flu, as I'll describe in a moment, and something that we're following up on very intensively now. So, you know, what I've described so far and what my group has done for the last several years is really validating these nanoparticles as a multivalent antigen display platform. And I feel like at this point we have convinced ourselves that it's really a robust and versatile platform. And so, you know, what's next? What, what are the next things that we're going to do? So one thing that we're attacking now that we hadn't previously is inducing broad responses against pathogens that rapidly mutate to evade immunity. And I'll talk a little bit about that in flu. Um, we're working on modulating the immune response through engaging innate immune pathways and, and either activating or, or blocking those. Um, we're really excited, as I mentioned at the beginning, about genetic immunization and in particular the potential of mRNA vaccines. And so we're adapting our platform so that it can be delivered genetically. And then finally, as I discussed on the last slide, we're really interested in, in the detailed geometry of epitope presentation and the structural correlates of immunogenicity. Can we identify what the ideal vaccine looks like? And we think we have a technology now where we can precisely vary 
the, the geometry of epitope presentation and really systematically investigate that question in a way that nobody has done before. And so I'll talk a little bit about inducing broad immunity in flu. So uh, flu is a major problem, of course. Um, the, one of the problems with flu is that it rapidly mutates. Next year's virus is different from this year's virus. And so the antibodies that you got from this year's vaccine don't work against next year's virus. So there's this huge family tree in flu. Um, there are four commonly circulating strains in humans or subtypes, uh, H1, H3, and the two B strains. And so those are the ones that are targeted by current seasonal vaccines. But you know the threat of pandemic outbreaks from some of these other uh, more exotic flu viruses is, is really something that's motivating the design of, of vaccines that induce broad immunity. So the major antigen on flu is hemagglutinin, again, the fusion protein, and it has these two regions, this head domain and the stem domain down at the bottom. So the head is the immunodominant region. Current vaccines mostly induce antibodies against the head, and those neutralize the virus by blocking attachment to the receptor on the host cell. The stem region has a highly conserved epitope and broadly neutralizing antibodies that neutralize almost all group one and two viruses have been identified, but it, this epitope is subdominant and so it's really hard to hit it using current vaccines. And so, you know, there's kind of a, a, a spread of what people might call universal flu vaccines, anything going from, you know, subtype specific where it neutralizes all H1 viruses all the way up to true universal all influenza viruses. And so, you know, people are working on all of these, but really even getting halfway down that universality plot is pretty tough. So again, current vaccines really drive anti-head responses upon your first exposure. You get, you know, a number of head antibodies and then some purple stem antibodies down at the bottom but not very many of those, and they tend to wane rapidly. And then upon repeated exposure or repeated vaccination, you just continue boosting that anti-head response. But the problem is that immunodominant head region is the part that mutates. So that's, what, that's how the virus evades immunity. It attracts you to this head region, but then it flips it on you and mutates it so that your antibodies no longer work. So, we teamed up with that group at the VRC that's done all this beautiful work. So this is Bar uh, Barney Graham and Masaru Kanekio, who developed this concept of what they're calling mosaic nanoparticle vaccines. So the idea here is to, sorry, my pointer is no longer working, but at the top right, um, co-display on the same nanoparticle multiple antigenic variants. So for example, this could be multiple hemagglutinins from different viral strains. You put them on the same nanoparticle, and by doing so, the idea is that you will preferentially activate B cells that are making cross-reactive B cell receptors. And that's because if the gray B cell is specific to a single strain, it will only bind you know, one of the antigens on the particle, but that particle will not drive receptor clustering because the BCR doesn't bind the other antigens there. The cross-reactive orange B cell binds all of the hemagglutinins on the particle, that drives receptor clustering, and you get expansion of that clone. And so you're, tr you're trying to tilt the, the, tilt the immune system towards the induction of, of you know, broadly reactive antibodies. And they published a paper last year that demonstrated proof of principle here, where they used that naturally occurring protein ferritin to co-display multiple monomeric receptor binding domains. So they just took the head off of hemagglutinin and it forms a monomer uh, when you do that and they uh, put multiple of those receptor binding domains onto ferritin. And when they did that and used it as a vaccine and compared to a mixture of nanoparticles where each particle displays a sing single hemagglutinin or sequential immunization with a series of nanoparticles, they found that the mosaic particle induced the broadest neutralizing response. So this is really encouraging and kind of suggests that you can uh, preferentially activate certain types of B cells through structure-based vaccine design. This system was limited in that you can only display monomeric antigens on ferritin. You can't do oligomeric uh, antigens like uh, full-length hemagglutinin ectodomains. 
Um, and there are a couple other limitations as well. So Barney and Masaru approached me and said, hey, we'd like to use your platform to co-display multiple hemagglutinins. And so that's what we've been doing with them over the last couple of years. And this particle is what we're calling a, a QIV, a quadri quadrivalent inactivated vaccine mosaic particle. We're taking the four strains in current commercial vaccines and putting those on the same particle to see if we can induce broader responses. And then of course we compare against, again, this cocktail of particles, each displaying a single hemagglutinin. And because of this in vitro assembly that I described earlier, it's very easy for us to make uh, particles co-displaying really whatever complement of hemagglutinins you want. So, you know, three different group one hemagglutinins, four hemagglutinins on the same particle, eight hemagglutinins on the same particle, you can really uh, go to your heart's desire here. So the immunization studies we've been doing compare the quadrivalent uh, mosaic particle to the cocktail, and then we also compare to current commercial vaccines. We want to benchmark against those and see how we're doing. And so I'll show some data um, from mice and non-human primates that we've got. So when we look at the at, at responses against the vaccine strains, so these are the hemagglutinins that are present in the vaccine, we see that our cocktails in blue and our mosaics in red are about equal to current commercial vaccines or perhaps slightly superior in terms of you know, neutralization of the virus. What's really interesting is when we go further afield and we look at distant cousins on the flu family tree, like pandemic bird flu, H5N1, we see that both nanoparticle formats significantly outperform the commercial vaccine. So for H7N9, for example, the commercial vaccine does absolutely nothing for you. You get no antibodies against H7, but both nanoparticle formats induced robust uh, binding and neutralizing antibodies against H7N9. So what we thought was happening was we were tilting, we were altering immunodominance and targeting, preferentially targeting that stem epitope, that broadly reactive stem epitope. And so the VRC has these, at the top middle of the slide, these uh, headless hemagglutinin antigens. It's just the stem region. And when we measure the binding of antibodies, of serum antibodies to those, we see the same patterns that we do in neutralization. And so we think that we are, in fact, targeting that stem region. And we've done a couple other experiments to show that as well. And in the NHP study that we did, we're getting basically the same effect. So we've done studies in mice, ferrets, and non-human primates. And in all three species, we see this outperformance against heterosubtypic strains by the, the nanoparticle vaccines. And then finally, when we do protection studies, we see the same thing. Both nanoparticle groups outperform commercial vaccines. And in protection and in a couple other serological uh, assays or readouts, we see the mosaic slightly but consistently outperforming the cocktail. And so that suggests that co-display of multiple antigens on the same particle really is doing something. And so we're just about to submit this, this paper for publication. Uh, but you know, what we think we are seeing is this stem-directed response against these heterosubtypic antigens. And really, when we think about this as a vaccine, we think of it as this is not a true universal vaccine. This is not neutralizing every strain out there. But this is what you might think of as like a seasonal plus or a super seasonal vaccine that may not require annual vaccination, but maybe it's every three years or every five years. And there's no bad years if you get a slight mismatch to the circulating strain. And so the VRC is manufacturing uh, this vaccine and moving it towards a phase one trial that we're hoping to initiate in April of next year. And so I'll stop there. Just a quick summary. summary. Um, Self-assembling proteins are, are one, of, one piece of this technological revolution in vaccine design. Many groups are pursuing this. Some of them are entering clinical trials. Our two component nanoparticles we think are, are a modular and, and versatile platform for antigen presentation uh, and particularly for inducing broad responses through co-display. We think we're uniquely suited to that. Um, and there's some additional work we're doing on, on structure-based design of antigen platforms uh, that maybe I can talk about next time. So anyway, this is the group. Um, we took one of our nanoparticles and turned it into an actual soccer ball and, and <laughs> had a soccer match outside and then took the classic soccer team photo. Um, and this is everyone here and then the collaborators involved.
uh, in both HIV structural characterization, RSV, uh, and then flu. And thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. So maybe I'll push you toward the, the, the part you hinted at and then didn't talk about, mm. which is RNA mm. vaccination or expression. You know, if, if the gene therapy issue, expression of RNA is a wonderful thing, it's actually pretty hard to do, right. as you know, with synthetic nanoparticles like that. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about how you're solving the Right, so the question is, you know, when we talk about genetic immunization and getting nucleic acid into the cell, how exactly is that happening? So, as you know, we are pursuing packaging and delivering of nucleic acids using this platform. But when I think of it, when I mention mRNA vaccines and I'm thinking of it here, I'm thinking of dovetailing with other people's technologies. So there are a lot of biotech companies that are delivering mRNA and lipid nanoparticles. And, you know, we're thinking for now, let's just use those. So use those technologies like Moderna and BioNTech and CureVac and all these to deliver nucleic acids encoding our nanoparticle vaccines. And so the advantage is, right, so there you're actually producing the antigen in the cytosol, so you should get CD8 responses in addition to CD4s. And then you can imagine, you know, our hope is that our nanoparticles would augment the humoral response because the cell would just start launching nanoparticle bombs at the draining lymph node, right? And we are hoping that that would make them more potent. The, the, I know the most potent vaccine that Moderna has characterized so far is their Zika nanoparticle vaccine. And so that is encouraging. But delivery is a very difficult problem, something we're working on, but long-term goal. Really exciting talk. Thank you so much. How easy is it for you to tune epitope density in your structure? And I'm thinking you're kind of directly cross-linking B cell receptors. Can you find out what's the optimum distance between epitopes and maybe use that as a general phenomenon to target both what is the antigen but the density and the food invasion of the B cells? Exactly. So the question is, you know, what level of control do we have over uh, the antigen density on the particle and its geometry, and how does that reflect uh, uh, drive the immunological response. So that is exactly the sort of thing that we're working on. So, so, you know, there are a couple knobs that we can turn here. So it's very, very easy for us to just leave a few holes on the particle and control antigen density or valency that way. And we have seen a correlation with the immune response. Higher density gives increased potency, except for HIV when you have that neutralizing epitope lowdown. The other thing we're doing is we're building particles of different sizes and shapes specifically to change the antigen geometry. And we're, we, we just got data back from our first experiment where we're literally just like spacing out the antigen in, in defined increments. And it, it wildly affects the immune response. So what we're hoping is that by systematically testing that, we will be able to identify what is the optimum density, what is the opti optimum distance between epitopes, right? And really come up with a blueprint for what the ideal vaccine looks like. And then, you know, is that different for every antigen or every pathogen, right? And all sorts of questions like this we think we need to answer. But w what we're hoping is we finally have the control over protein structure that will allow us to systematically test that question. So there could be lots of reasons why a self-assembling nanoparticle could actually enhance the immunogenicity of an antigen. You didn't talk about that so much, but right. I'm curious to hear sort of what you're thinking about in that space and also have, have you considered the possibility or, or, or evaluated the possibility that the, the nanoparticle actually has T cell epitopes, mm. so it's functioning as a carrier protein, which is still totally bueno. Right, right. So the question is, you know, there are lots of potential mechanisms by which nanoparticles could enhance the immune response, and, and what do we know mechanistically? Um, so, yeah, again, this is all kind of happening in real time. So, so people are, are, are doing this. That paper last year that I mentioned on trafficking to lymph nodes and two B cell follicles within lymph nodes really blew my mind, and, and, and they really got quite mechanistic. They showed that this is complement-driven, Right? And then opsonization by complement leads to antigen relay into B cell follicles and then retention on the fo follicular dendritic cell network. 
It's that level of mechanistic detail that we need. We're just starting to do that sort of thing. And I think we're kind of, you know, we're structural biologists. We're kind of catching up and learning immunology as we go. Um, but those are the sorts of me mechanistic studies that we're getting into. Regarding T-cell epitopes and the nanoparticle subunits, so yeah, I mean, these are like bacterial proteins or de novo designed proteins. I'm sure they're chock full of T-cell epitopes. And so we're starting to investigate that and also incorporating pathogen-derived T-cell epitopes, right, so, to try to, to basically get a, a recall response upon encounter with a pathogen. But we're just digging in a mechanism. We, we think that B cell, cross -link, B cell receptor cross-linking is a main driver. Trafficking is also a main driver, but there are probably other things that we just don't know about yet. So, um, sorry, follow-up question. Um, if ferritin self-assembles physiologically, mm -hmm. I just learned something about ferritin that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Does it self-assemble in physiologic conditions? Yes. And, and that's part of its function? Yeah, so it's, fun it's fascinating. It's a fascinating protein. So it's a little container for iron. So what it does is it actually mineralizes iron inside that little protein nanocage and just carries it around as like a storage unit. Yeah, so that's what ferritin is doing. So when they, when they were gearing up for their phase one, the FDA was like, did the monkeys get anemic? Right, because you know, do you generate anti-ferritin antibodies? And and they show they're using Helicobacter pylori ferritin actually, and they show that there's no cross-reactivity to either NHP or human ferritin. Well, that was going to be my first question. So, if you use host-derived scaffolds, yeah. you haven't seen anti-host responses that would worry you about autoimmunity or anything like that. So the question is, you know, what if you use scaffolds that are either host-derived or close enough to a host to get cross-reactive antibodies? I am very worried about that, and so we try to stay as far away from human proteins as possible. Because, you know, you might think, oh, use a human protein, then you get, take advantage of tolerance and you won't get anti-scaffold responses, but we're mutating it and turning it into a particle, right? And so it just freaks me out. And so we tend to, to use very, very heterologous. So my other question is about your um, multi-antigen vaccination. So, you know, normally you get antigen interference and competition in antigen-presenting cells, so yeah. I just want to make sure I you are doing this mosaic immunization, you're selecting for a B cell, that, a single B cell that actually um, recognizes all of those, not a bunch, and permitting them to survive. Is that correct? That's the idea. So the question is, you know, the antigenic competition is a thing, but, but what we're proposing is that on these mosaic particles, you're actually activating B cells, a single B cell that cross-reacts with all of the displayed antigens. That is the idea, and I think the... I think the paper that the VRC published last year supported that, and then I think our work in FLU collaboratively with them further supports that. In my mind, the question is not fully answered. I think we need to do more detailed studies. The four strains of hemagglutinin that we co-displayed are really quite distant, and so there really aren't that many B cells that can cross-react with all of them. I think we need to really dig into this and validate that that is actually happening, but that is the idea. Some data I didn't show here, We've also co-displayed completely unrelated proteins, so like RSVF and influenza hemagglutinin, and we can titrate the valency of each. And what you, know, what you might think is as you titrate the valency down, your immune response against hemagglutinin is going to go down. What we actually see is that the optimum response against both antigens occurs at 50-50. And so uh, that has to be a T-cell thing. Right, I mean, I, I just can't imagine what else that would be. And so we're doing studies like that as well to try to understand the cellular response here. So if you try to Absolutely. So the question is, you know, if you mask the, un physically mask the underlying nanoparticle, do you dampen the response against it? We're intensively exploring that right now using a variety of masking methods. And the answer is yes. If you mask the underlying nanoparticle, you do dampen the response against it. And then the next question we're trying to ask is, does that then augment the response against the displayed antigen? And we're right in the middle of that work right now.
other sort of properties of DNA reparation is to also change the antibody properties mm. in terms of, right, because there's some evidence that vaccine efficacy depends on not just neutralization, but the other things the antibody can do, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering if you can augment those properties. Right. Yeah. So the question is, you know, can we can we induce certain types, you know, perhaps isotypes of antibodies that have certain effector functions, you know, beyond just getting a neutralizing response? This is something we're very interested in. Um, I so our approach to that is going to be to engage innate immune pathways and try to kind of tune things one way or another, um, and we're just kind of booting that up as a research thrust in the lab. Um, but it's early days on that, and it's something that I'm very, I'm trying to read as much as I can on the topic, because again, we're kind of learning immunology as we go. But yeah, I think, you know, if we can elicit high levels of certain effector functions, it can be really powerful. Yep. You didn't talk much about adjuvants. Mm. Right, so the question is, what about adjuvants and could we incorporate those into the system? So um, it depends on the antigen. So hemagglutinin is incredibly immunogenic. So even without adjuvant, we induce high levels of neutralizing antibodies and protection. Um, you know, other antigens do absolutely nothing without adjuvants. So we do often test that, and in some cases, we've done adjuvant screening. Um, you know, from our perspective, one of the motivations was to show that the particles are compatible with a wide variety of adjuvants, and they, they seem to be the particles themselves are quite stable. In terms of incorporating adjuvants into the particle, it, it ties into that same thing. That's where we're really thinking of designing proteins that, that turn dials in the immune system by, by hitting certain receptors, right? Um, and so, you know, I think of those as protein-based adjuvants, and then hopefully they would be you would only activate antigen-specific cells because the antigen would, would drive you to this specific cell, and then that adjuvant molecule that you've displayed on your particle would engage. The other thing you could imagine is putting, for instance, you know, toll, -like, toll agonists, you know, single-stranded nucleic acid or whatever, inside the particles. Um, that's something that it's easy for us to do. We haven't really done it yet because I really want to focus on those protein-based adjuvants. If we can do it entirely by protein without having to bring other molecules into it, I think it would ease manufacturing and it would also maintain the uh, possibility of genetic immunization. You've been targeting these complex antigens, which is both a, a, a very considerable challenge but also a really important one. Um, one thing we have application for, though, with, uh, would be improving our ability to make peptides to sit down. Is that just too simple? Actually, no, no, no. So we've tried that. It's really interesting. Um, what we found, so, you know, you have the classic carrier of proteins like KLH and uh, bacteriophage, virus-like particles are really good at displaying peptide epitopes at very high density. So what we, we tend to do things through genetic fusion. And so the peptide epitopes end up at lower density on our particles. And we've actually found that they're not as good as, for instance, KLH, where you can just maximize the density of the peptide epitope. So, you know, I mean, we could try to develop ways to increase epitope density, but there are existing technologies that, we, that do it. Yeah. I follow up on that question. Mm. So, is there like a database of human protein clusters that you're able to probe and kind of weed out the individual clusters that you might Question is, how do we ensure that we're avoiding, you know, scaffolds that we would lead to cross-reactive responses against humans. There, you know, there are like predicted T cell epitope databases, IEDB and things like this. Um, what we tend to look for is uh, just similarity to the human genome or proteome. And then we go in and we look at the peptide level and try to minimize the similarity between peptides derived from the scaffolds and those from humans. Turns out you always find peptides where like seven out of nine are identical. I mean, just statistically, you're going to. Uh, and if you look at licensed vaccines, those have seven out of nine, not many eight out of nines, and usually no nine out of nines. And so we try to kind of match that profile of vaccines with, with track records of safety. But you're not looking at epitopes or anything? It, no. So we thought about that. It's really hard to try to look at conformational epitopes. It's just a very, very difficult problem.
Cool. Thank you.